Welcome to the Recruitment Mentors Podcast. My name is Hish Mazuz. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by John Dyson, who is the founder of FJR Group. John has worked in the recruitment industry for over two decades, and in this time, he built himself a successful career, uh, progressing through the ranks to director level at Robert Half within seven years. And before then, and he then decided to start his own recruitment business in 2011. And for the last decade, John has been dedicated to growing the FJR group, who now have multiple brands within the group across finance, tech, HR, and executive search. They're currently nearly 50 strong with offices across the UK and soon to be in the States. And their ultimate vision is to be in 25 locations and to be doing 25 million pounds turnover in each location in 25 years. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So where we always like to start, <clears throat> million pound question. Yep. So in your opinion, what characteristics and, characteristics and traits do you think make up a highly successful recruitment consultant? Um, I, I think there's, like all things, fairly, fairly varied. Um, I think the great thing about recruitment is we're selling to uh, so many different characters, personalities and I suppose character traits uh, on the other side of the fence that I think there are certainly you know, your, your common traits that, that come out, the determination, the competitive element and all the rest of it. But I do think that, you know, one of the things that we try to have um, within FJR is, is a balance of characters, a balance of traits, mm. because I don't necessarily think that if everyone is, you know, ha has that sort of complete, has to be number one competitor instinct to all the rest of it when you start to build teams and you start to try and grow you can't all be number one at the same time you want to foster that level of competition um but i think you know one of the things that certainly as we grew the business is you know you need a blend of personalities you know mm. i think we always look for someone who who has got that just natural inquisitiveness you know i think the great thing about recruitment is you can go into most people's business, regardless of, you know, what level you're operating at. And you can ask some really intelligent questions and understand what's going in those businesses. And, and, you know, I think personally, for me, that level of inquisitiveness starts to then uncover, not just on the client side, but on the candidate side as well, how people are going to sort of fit into into a business. So certainly the inquisitiveness. Um, and I think, you know, the old fashioned, you know, working hard, determination, however you want to badge that one up. But yeah, recruitment is is a tough game, um, and you need someone who's got that level of resilience that can can keep going when the chips are down. And you know, I think certainly the best people I've seen have had that sort of natural intelligence, inquisitiveness, but but they've also also got a very steely core. You know, where they're very clear in terms of you know what they need to do, how they need to do it, and that resilience to to commit to achieving that. Nice. So I think they're probably now, they're, they're probably the big ones that I would. I would look for and then outside that you, you've got all the soft skills and all the rest of it but 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 i think then it's mm. about blending as you look at your team so i have to ask you this because we're actually doing um an event on it this month and i just find it's fascinating so obviously you always typically hear resilience and recruitment hand in hand right i think you possess it yeah it's I, interesting i don't i don't think uh so, so an example is um, yeah i was at a barbecue in 2000 and 2006 2006 so i was at a barbecue um maybe it's a little bit before that and um we were all having a few beers and it was like right you know what's the toughest thing you can do what's the toughest thing you know lads around a barbecue <laughs> 20, i was probably late 20s maybe just 30 then um and it was like someone said right it's the marathon de sable which is like six marathons in seven days through the sahara desert carry all your own food and all the rest of it and uh, me and a very good friend went, all right, yeah, we'll do that. Oh, my God. Um, and uh, so on the Monday, we entered. We were like, okay, we'll enter. And we've always, I've always been fit, but not like super marathon fit or anything like this. Um, and, yeah, we, we were on like a two-year waiting list. So we were in for 2007. And uh, ultimately, uh, the, the Iran-Iraq war kicked off. A load of people got sort of... Uh, sort of brought in and we were on a waiting list and you get a call and you go you're on the waiting list are you serious or not and once you go yes I am you sort of and clearly for Com two years I'm bragging bragging to my mates about it I'm going to do this I'm rocking <laughs> um, 
And then one day I got a call and they were like, uh, you've got a place. Um, oh my and God. That was, that was in the September. Uh, so that was September 06. Um, my son was born, my first son was born in September 06. And then the, the race was in uh, April 07. Um, and clearly I turned up you know, with, with my, you know, I can do anything recruitment attitude. We, we, we're <laughs> bloody good at what we do. Um, and I think, you know, once I was there, I realized I was so far out of my depth. It was <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but I suppose when I, when the race started, day one, you're fine, the adrenaline and all the rest of it. And then suddenly you realize, oh my God, I've got to do this. I've, I've, got, I've got another 140 miles to go through the desert. I'm eating crap food on a little hexi stove. I'm sleeping on the floor of a desert. I can't have a shower. Um, I've got no home comforts whatsoever because I can only carry, you're only allowed to carry what you carry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it's like, right, you're in. And the amount of people that had Iron Men tattooed all down their legs and they'd done multiple triathlons and, you know, Adonis of men and women just crashed. Day two, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 people just dropped out just dropped it. They're like, I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't. Yeah, yeah. They're like, but you're, there's nothing wrong with you. You know? uh, and, and I suppose my attitude, I started pretty well. Performance went down, but it's like, I will not, not finish. I will put one foot in front of the other and I will keep going. And I kept thinking to myself, well, you know, during the war, people had their arm blown off and, and walked out the desert. You know, I've got yeah. a few blisters. So just keep going. And I think that level of resilience, I didn't realize I had that level of resilience in the workplace. It doesn't come out quite in the same way. Yeah, of course. It's extreme. That, that, that was probably the first time in what I was in my early 30s then that I really realized that when, when I put my mind to something, it's, yeah. it's about, it, was, it was pain. It was emotional. It was, you know, your tent got blew away at night. So you didn't even have good night's sleeps, you know. You literally got up at six o'clock in the morning. It'd take me half an hour to get my shoes on because I had all these blisters. My toenails were coming off and all the rest of it. And it's like, I will not quit. You know, I will not quit. I will, I will keep going. Um, and we went, there was one stage, which is on day four. And it's, you, 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 it's, it's a 60 mile stage and you go through the night. And I was doing my mate. And, and after two days, I was like, look, you're much fitter than me. You trained properly. You did all the research you're a bastard but well done crack on yeah i'll just i'll, just, I'll, I'll see you at the tent at night but don't worry i'll always make it and there was a stop where you could stop at night and they'd sort of built an area where you could bed down and then continue the next day if you wanted to stop and um i found a number of people from my tent and they were all fitter than me they were they were all more prepared for me and they were sitting around a little fire crying and i was like oh my god what are you doing what are you doing they were just broken. And it was yeah. like, I remember it was like, just pick them up. Guys, we are doing this. This is part of this. It's not about, you, you need to go through the night. We can make so much time. And just bringing that group through, that resilience, I was like, I, I wasn't ever sure demonstrating that. And, and I don't think you, you either have it or you don't. There's no, at that point when you've been stripped bare of all the other yeah. things, that's when you really know you got it. And it's tough to find that in people. It's tough to find it in an interview because, yeah. you know, but it is trying to dig into some of those things where people have really been up against something and what have they done? Yeah. What a great story. And honestly, that the whole sort of, um, I'm absolutely fascinated with sort of ultra runners and things like that. Cause like, it's what you're talking about. It's that sort of realization of what you're capable of. Which must just be this amazing, crazy feeling of like, oh my, like, what else can I do in my life if I really put my mind to it, as you said? Yeah. And it's like, wow. But I guess, I guess I have to ask, like, where, like you said, obviously you possess it or you don't. I then, I then feel like that a lot of that can be created and formed in sort of early parts of your life. So I have to ask, like, what, what was what was it like for you growing up then? Where like do you feel like your childhood had an impact on this? Or I have to ask. Um, I, I had a really privileged background, so I I, yeah. you know, I I was very lucky. I was I was born in Japan, um, 
I, I spent my informative years in the Far East. Um, I went to boarding school from the age of eight. So I think oh, wow. probably that level of independence, uh, you know, I, I used to fly around the world on my own at eight and a half. Um, wow. Know, and, and so, you know, I suppose that level of independence maybe maybe came from that. But, you know, I, I don't, I, I can't point to something that happened in my childhood that, that you know, adversity, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, Fair I, was very, I was very fortunate. Um, but I do think probably that independence of going to boarding school, which I loved, um, and that independence of, you know, you, you're nine years old and you go to Heathrow and, you know, it was in the days where you'd fly to the Far East and you, you'd fly to Germany, you'd fly from Germany to the Middle East, you'd fly from the Middle East to the next spot. And then the next, yeah. you know, it, it, it was, you know, it's when planes didn't go very far um, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but um but no so I, I i can't i can't point to something that from, from that perspective i mean my father was always he, he set businesses up that's what we ended up moving around so he, he worked for big corporate businesses i suppose at the forefront of i suppose globalization he worked for big uk yeah. and us corporates and he would set up their businesses in in singapore malaysia hong kong japan and they right. would move on to the next the, the next business so I suppose we were always there was always an element of a startup type, not startup, but there was always an element of sales entrepreneurism. Um, my sister runs her own business and my brother runs his own business. So there's oh, got to wow. be something in our bring, upbringing. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, has meant that we're either not very good at taking orders or <laughs> something that, um, you know, something that's affected us. But yeah, I love that. No, I, I was just I was just curious. Um, so, look, I guess. Very, very quickly then, because I want us to focus on sort of John, the business owner journey. Yep. But obviously, there's a lot to unpack here, right? Being in the industry for a solid amount of time. So yep. like, I guess if we were to pack it all together, obviously, your time at Robert Half, which was a, a long amount of time, there's a couple of other companies that I can see you work for before then. But like, yep. how, I guess we always want to talk about people interested, like how how would you describe your sort of early days in recruitment? Like what, what was john's early days of recruitment like what was that like for you how would you describe it um i mean so I mean, the early days i mean I, I didn't really understand what recruitment was when i first got into it um you know very honestly i got a job at stanford airport job center working for a technical recruitment business um sending people out to holland to to, to work um petrochemical welders that sort of stuff um i think pretty quickly i realized that you know i i didn't I, I, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't really that that fulfilling in terms of sort of the professionalism of what we were doing. You know, I'd be sure. advertising in the back of the sun. Um, you know, so it, it didn't it didn't necessarily feel. You know, it was it was a, it was a great business, great sounding. Um, I then went and joined a a, a, a finance and accounting recruitment business, um, a small business, six of us in the office. I was basically just given a senior qual desk, and it was like, speak to these people. And this is yeah. what you do. And, and and I think I suppose back in back at that point, you know, CRMs weren't there. You had you know CVs on your desk, you had not quite roller decks, but you know, all, all the CVs there. So I think in those days it was it was just it was about building the relationships. It was it was mm. probably far more you had a small amount of time, you were posting CVs, you were, you know, all it was just it was just probably um less less fast paced, but but I would probably say longer. Because you know, I felt that probably you were you were working into the evenings more because you had less time to contact people. You know, there was no email, there was nothing. You know, so yeah. Therefore, it sort of things things drifted drifted for a lot longer. I think, um, and it was great. You know, recruitment's the same. It, it, it you know, your tools have changed, but actually, what we're doing is still the same. I mean, you know, we still meet candidates in the same way. We still do. You just got Teams to do it now, or Zoom to do it now. But um, you know ultimately it hasn't changed that much it's become more competitive it's probably become faster um but ultimately that the, the the service we provide and and how we do it and what makes people good in the late 90s to make people good at you know the early 2020s i think the skill sets are pretty much the same still um yeah. you, know, you have all the tools we have today but if you don't do some of the fundamentals and you can't build a relationship and you can't you can't do those things you're going to really struggle in our industry yeah so so let's just go into the last sort of 10 years then so obviously you had a real solid amount of time working for other people so as yep. you mentioned in your it sort of seemed like it was sort of uh you was destined to start your own business potentially you may say um yes. 
But like, obviously, there's a lot of people that say they're going to start their own recruitment business, and then there's not as many people that actually do it. So I guess yeah. I just always like to start like what what gave you the confidence in 2011 to take that first step and start your so, own recruitment so, business. So I I would say I was a yeah not not reluctant, but it was never it was never necessarily on my career plan. Yeah, if, 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 really? I back, if, if I went back 15 years and someone said to me this is where you're going to be in 10 years time. I'd be like, nah, no, nah, that's, that's, that not, not because, because of what we've done. It just, just saw myself as this, I'm this corporate person. Um, oh, wow. And, and that was, that was you know, really interesting. I love my time at, at Robert half. Um, and yeah, I think I, I, I don't, I don't know what it was, but I think I got to a point where I just realized I was, I, I was a passenger in this ship. You know, it mm. wasn't, it wasn't really, it wasn't really that fulfilling. Um, it yeah. wasn't really, you know, you weren't changing necessarily people's lives internally, externally, you know, I, I don't quite mean it, but if I got hit by a bus, the next person would be on, take on my role. And, you know, 12 months later, it's John who, um, and, and so I think I, 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 I think I just started to try and change things and play around with things. And obviously that doesn't work in a, in a corporate environment. Um, so I think you know it got to a point where it was like right okay what do I want to do, um, and I interviewed with lots of smaller recruitment businesses thinking all right well if if, if I go in as MD or CEO I've got the opportunity to 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 change things there's there's less risk for the family um, you know but you know if a company's looking for a new CEO the chances are there's there's some skeletons in the closet if you see what I mean um, <laughs> so I, I sort of went through a few of those processes. And and I suppose as, as as I got to the end of it, my father-in-law um, and and particularly my but particularly my father-in-law and my brother-in-law um, were both like you you should do it yourself. And I'm like mm. I don't know I don't know I don't know. Um, and you know I suppose collectively we're right okay if we put this amount of money together, we can have a good good run at it. Probably twelve months worth of of of, of decent cash, and we can hire a few people. Um, and let's give it a go. You know, I wasn't walking out of Robert Half with a bank of clients. You know, I never had clients at Robert Half. It was it, it wasn't how our role was. If you said, I mean, it was. Are you using the leadership position? It wasn't like yeah. billing and, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, you know, the, the um, I suppose inertia of going, wow, I'm going to have to start building from the bottom. I don't, I don't, I don't have a black book. I don't have client names. You know, it's it's literally I'm starting from 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 scratch. Um, and that was that sort of held me back. And then it was like, you know what? Actually, I know I can do it. I know I was good at what I did. Um, I managed to find a couple of people. Um, one person who who joined me, she did all the admin, and I'd worked with her at, at, at Robert Half for eight years, so I trusted her. So she did basically everything non-sales. So it took all of that stuff away from me. She nice. Did all that, the CRMs, the the the. the absolutely everything and all i had yeah. to do was sell so it was sort of like in a really weird way being in a corporate <laughs> but there was two of us if you see what i mean it's like i need this yeah, yeah. she'd go and sort it and then I'd, I'd crack on so um you know i went back to my qual finance days um that's that's what we build um you know i'd always looked after finance technology and we launched a little bit of an hr pilot at robert half um, so it was always I wanted those three brands, um, and and I suppose then as we started to go, okay, well, what, what else do our clients want? You started to pick up, I suppose, the the executive positions, and yeah. that needed a slightly different delivery mechanism. And I, you know, we go forward ten years, we have multiple delivery mechanisms now for our clients. Um, you know, and it's very clear in terms of when we speak to clients, well, what what service do they need and want from us, and and, and what does that look like? Um, but I think, you know, certainly in the early days, it, it wasn't like I'm going to go and set my business up and I was prepping to do that. It was, you know, fate, whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, I suppose those around you going, yeah, no, you can do it. You and then just it, yeah. that in a belief to go, all right, let's do it. Um, my yeah. wife. I also think you did it in a smart way as well. 12, you obviously, not how many people will go with like 12 months runway, I'm not sure. Yeah. How many like you've got that? The obviously the hire on the ad, the support and admin side, smart because I think yeah. that's a lot of the things that people underestimate the amount of other stuff you have to do if you're starting your own business on your own. So I feel like you you also did it in a smart way. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, I, I, 
I'd love to say all of that was, <laughs> and I think you know, I think this is this is. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people about people who set up their own businesses and all the rest of it, and 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 I think one of the traits for for some people is you can overthink it. Yeah. You know, just just start. The first step. Take that first step. Take the first step, and and you'll start to work stuff out. You know, you, yeah. it's not it's not you know. I, I've always with with. Um, uh, Chrissy, who's, who's this person I set up with, um, you know, she was always talking about you need strategies, you need this, you need this, and I'm like, well, we do have a strategy, but I'm not going to spend a day, two days, a week, you know, writing a strategy document for the next twelve months. I need to place more people, I need to interview more people, I need to, you know, put out more contractors, I need to do this, I need to do that. It's pretty clear what we need to do on the sales side, and then you know, the other stuff starts to look after itself, especially when you're a smaller business. And then I suppose as you grow, you then need to form your 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 strategies, your visions, and all the rest of it. But the vision hasn't changed from day one. The, the vision has always been: it was by 2041. So you know, we, we moved on a bit, and it's now 25 in 25, and we're about eight, we're 10 years into or four years into that. Um, but it was always 25 locations by 2041 is where we wanted to get to. It, that that's never changed. It was always about this global adventure. It was always about taking all the good stuff from somewhere like Robert Half, taking the great stuff from previous businesses I'd worked at um, and go, right, well, how do we put these together where you only get one shot at a career? So let's make sure we all enjoy it. You know, let's make sure we all share in, in the good stuff. Um, and yeah, you know, I've taken some risks. So at the end of the day, I might make end up making a little bit more money than everyone else. But it's about going on this adventure with people and going, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people about it. It's like, you know, there will be a day when, we're sitting somewhere in a far flung place in the earth and go, crap, can you remember when we did this podcast and um, <laughs> you know, we were 50 people and now we're X hundred people or with this or with that. And just having that ability to, I suppose, reflect with people and enjoy the adventure with those people. That's so important to me because this isn't the John Dyson show. This is, this is about building something that, that many, many people can be super, super proud of their contributions and, knowing that we wouldn't have been able to do it without each other it's it's not a it's not a solo journey you know building yeah. a business is about the collective and the better the collective the better you are yeah i love that so what i'm keen to do john if it's okay with you is just to just to um drill down in some like some practical things yeah. on on this business journey because i know that's what people realize so if we could just like if you could just paint a picture for us on where the business is today and then we can go through I guess just sort of a bit of the journey really as um yes yeah, so like where is the business today then so you said how many people do you employ what are you turning over how many locations etc so we will probably do somewhere around 10 million something around that in in sales yeah um, we've got 40 just shade under 50 people um yeah. within the business probably seven or eight of them are in operational roles so so uh, uh, the support functions, finance, HR, technology. Um, we've got offices in uh, Manchester, London, uh, and Chicago. Um, we started Chicago beginning in May, and we will have our Edinburgh location live probably at some point over August, beginning of September. Um, so, yeah, we'll be four, four offices in with a view that probably we'll have another uh, location in the U.S., um probably first half of next year um, nice. we've we've stayed true to the to, to the i suppose the verticals that we've spoken about so finance technology hr and the exec piece um i think certainly from uh, you know when you start to go into the big metropole markets those markets get divided down a little bit more so you know within london sure. there's specialist financial services and then within financial services there's there's further verticals that drop below that um but I suppose you, when you start to look at a, a, an office like a Manchester business, um, you know, it's probably slightly more geographical in terms of the focus. Um, sure. So, okay, great. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess, so, okay, cool. So then I guess what would just help? I know it's not just about headcount, but it just helps paint a bit of a picture for people. So yep. just for context, you were describing them sort of really early days. So that's where you are today. Obviously, 10 years is a long time. So like, in the like first sort of three years, let's say in, uh, like going into like the fourth year, where like how many people did you have in the business? 
then maybe six years in and then obviously the last bit just to paint a picture for people on like how long it's taken you know i think it's so, important to yeah so showcase think, that so, so i think the manchester business um so we were very manchester centric until we set the the london business up three years ago okay um, so i think at, at, at the peak probably manchester was or the business was so let's say after seven years manchester was probably about 30 heads we had about 30 heads in the business okay cool um, london then added in the addition and then we've sort of grown again in both of those locations um, well, uh, so so i suppose probably year three we were 12 to 15 heads something like that yeah. um we grew quite quickly in the first couple of years and we were 10 heads after about 18 months um, yeah. so, so we grew quite quickly from that perspective and we yeah, I suppose the focus has always been this split between permanent and and contract, and we try and make sure that sixty to seventy percent of our revenues are contract. Um, okay, it's not always the case, um, but certainly having that consistent contract revenue in the back, background and just supporting cash flow with the interims has been a massive part of us being able to grow, um, just because of the consistency. And I think you know again. That was a big lesson that came out of Robert Half in terms of the balance of your business between perms and contract and the stability that can give you in terms of your business planning over a three to six months period. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. So I guess, look, I was saying this to you before, so let's just go into here because we're talking about headcount growth and these things. Most, um, a lot of recruitment business owners are in that sort of around that 15 head mark or um, 10 head mark. And a lot of the questions that I get from them is just to, I guess, speak to people like you who are further down the track on how you have gone from that sort of 15, 20 mark to 30, 40, 50. Because I feel like more, the more and more conversations I've had, that can be like a really difficult transition yeah. um, to achieve that. So I guess if, I, if I'm someone that's listening, that I do have aspirations to get to that it seems like you've just mentioned the importance of if you don't have a contract but that's something you should be thinking about but yep. if i'm currently at that sort of 10 15 head mark and i know i want to go to the that 30 40 plus i guess what were some of the biggest pains for you that you had to go through what would be some of the sort of key bits of advice that you'd give me um i, I suppose the, the the first of all is finding finding a a a, a very tight group of people around you that can share some of that burden. Yeah, you know, once you mm. go past fifteen people, you, you know you can't be, you can't necessarily be on top of everyone every single day to give them support. And you also need to blend, I suppose, the individuals coming into your business. You can't, you can't continue to hire people at a mid to senior level. You have to start to train your own. You have to start bringing some of those sort of, um, I suppose, people who are earlier in their recruitment careers through. So, so I suppose, you know, first and foremost, it's it's having one maybe two other people that can start to carry some of that some of that sort of burden of bringing people through i think that's that, mm. that's a massive thing and that that took a while to get right you know it wasn't something we got right straight away um and i think it's also very important to make sure that you do have one eye on that blend within your business otherwise you do end up with you you go forward and then suddenly you realize you've got four people who are in exactly the same level within the same part of your business and two of them will go i'm off and mm. because you know there's no they, they can't all progress to being the manager of that team they can't all so it's about you know it's trying to make sure that you're managing those careers and making sure those individuals understand exactly what their careers are and 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 having that 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 mix of people within the teams because i think again yeah we've made those mistakes where suddenly we've arrived at a point and everything feels brilliant and suddenly you have you know a, a, a firm of 20 people four people resign you've lost 20 percent you know <laughs> you know it's it, it's big and and you know we all know in recruitment it feels like resignations never come in their ones it's like one goes and then someone goes oh yeah yeah, yeah so that's it starts, true it starts to snowball so so i suppose that 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 balance of of of, of making sure that your teams are blended um is Good critically point. important um so that, yeah. that'd be certainly the other one um and i suppose for, for me you know probably making sure that um you know from a personal perspective you understand that your business will have to change as you grow you know when you're you know whatever you know when, when you're a team of 10 people your business is just of a size and a scale that is so different to 20 people and i know that sounds but it's but suddenly you've got 
so many other things that take your attention away. You've got so many other things that start to happen within your business. Um, and I think, therefore, having those people around and going, OK, well, what are the things that are absolute true you know, pillars? You know, I talk about you know, people, passion, principle, performance. So you, you get the right people with the right traits that they're, they're passionate about recruitment. Um, they're passionate about you know going out and, and and not not selling but but they enjoy recruitment you've got to enjoy what you do so you're passionate about that principle that gets kicked around a lot you know how many big corporates have principles as you know their sort of thing but yeah. i suppose principle for me is how would you like your brother or your mother or your sister or your your best mate to be treated as they go through a recruitment process and and just mm -hmm. treat your candidates like that that that's how i want you to treat your candidates like not like they're your best mate and you have to pick the phone up all the time but keeping them updated and all the rest of it. And if you do those three things, you will get performance. You will get, you know, if you're passionate about it, people will feel that passion and they'll come back to you, you know, principles. So it's, so I suppose it's keeping what's really core and then going to some of the other stuff, it works when you're 10 people, but when you're 15, 20, it doesn't. Um, you know, it may be that the guy that runs, I don't know, team A, he might want to take his team out as a team of six. And it's like, oh, well, where, where's where's my invite? You know, and it's like, well, mm -hmm. that's not your team anymore, John. You need you need to let go. You need to allow them to build the culture within their team. And and I suppose it's it's having having a uh, a vision of like what's absolutely key to you and your business. And then what's the stuff that yeah, it was really good when we were ten people or fifteen people. But right, okay, well now it's your turn to carry that baton and 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 not always be the person that that comes in to solve things because yeah. otherwise you you never you never break those those um cut the apron strings whatever you want to call it um mm. and that really does hamper growth that if you're always the person that has to be there to to, yeah, to yeah. pick those things up how what what's been your journey with that because i was having a really interesting and i feel like that can be like a really common barrier because yep. like I think some people, as you said, like where you started, like you just you just want to sell, you want to do the deals and you want to be involved in these types of things. And that's uh, most of the stories. Most people were recruiters and that before they obviously start their own recruitment business, right? So they've always been involved in that. And I was having a really interesting chat with a business owner the other day who is sort of a year, 18 months away from hopefully um, getting to a point um, of an event in his business and he wants to give yeah. their an opportunity to his employees or other people to buy into the business take it to the next level and he's really had to go on this journey of like getting out of his own way because he used to be yeah. the person that could name all the contractors on their book and he was one of their biggest performers and stuff like that but over the last year or so to make this business more valuable and make sure like you said you're not the person that's always solving the problems or is relied on Obviously, then all of a sudden, John's got to work out what his purpose is and what, like, within this business that you started, right? I guess I'm just curious yep. as to, like, what what's your journey been like with that? Has it been quite easy to get out of your own way? Is that, yeah? <laughs> um, no, it's, it's not. It's, <laughs> yes, yes and no. I suppose, you know, what, what limited our growth in terms of the next location, there was a big trust thing. There was a big, mm. massive trust thing for me. Um, and, you know, Neil, who 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 joined joined the business, you know, invested in the business. Um, you know, that that trust because we worked together for for a number of years at, at half. There was just this trust, and it's like, yeah, I'm 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 there are the keys. You know, let me know what you want, but crack on. You know, I'll, I'll give so you. So it's trust for you. So trust in another person it's, to it's trust in another person to to do it. Um, you know, I think Manchester for a long time was you know. It, I suppose it was it was you know my baby if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think again, you know, everyone who's been through our doors and may have left may still be here. You know, they all played a massive part in getting us to where we got to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and I think, you know, I'd, I'd like to think that you know the majority of people that have left our business think think well of our business. You know, wish us well and all the rest of it. You know, we haven't had many uh, acrimonious departures or anything like that. Um, but I think it is then trying to find as you grow, right? Well, sometimes there is a six month transition or a, a transition period where it's like, you just have to, as you said, get out of your own way and you might not really know what you're doing. As in, <laughs> I found myself doing a load of just pure recruitment. You know, I was like a consultant at home. Um, 
I had the rest of the business, <laughs> but I was just running my own assignments. And you know, I was, I was, you know, I was there on the end of the phone for 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 you know, for, for people that required me. But it was like they need the space. They don't need me in Manchester. They 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 they're they're a good group. And and I suppose I ended up just putting fees on the board, probably for about three to six months, just just doing that. Um, <laughs> and and I suppose that allowed me to feel like at least I've got a sense of purpose. There was parts of times where I was like, John, you've gone back ten years, and it's like, well. You're putting your fees into your own business, John. So get over yourself and crack on. Um, yeah. So you know it's and and suddenly you enjoy it again, and then you realise why you did the job in the first place for something. So it's like it's trying to make mm. sure that you keep remembering some of the things, and then you do. You're able to sit down with the guys in the office when they do ask for help, and it's like, well, this is what I did the other day, and this is how this worked, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, the old dinosaur in the corner can still <laughs> still do some stuff. Um, you know, so it's it's <laughs> it's sort of I, th I think it's it's. I suppose you know, it gets said a lot, doesn't it? But it's like you're never too big to do the little things in the business. So you know, mm. if you're struggling to know what to do, pick up the phone and start speaking to clients. Get some jobs on for the teams. Go and go and do something that you know is going to help the business. Might feel mm. like you left that behind. Well, it'd be good to reconnect with certain people, whatever it might be. And I think you know, certainly one of the things that you know we've always spoken about, you know, myself, Neil, now Max is. We have to be able to point to revenue. We have to be able to point to clients that we're bringing in every month. We might not be fulfilling, but we need to be able to hand and, and rain make or whatever you want to go, because that's really important for the team. You know, and I think sometimes in the bigger, bigger, bigger corporate businesses, you know, you said at the beginning, leadership. And it's like, well, you know, there's got to be a little bit of leadership around sort of the client side as well. And I think that sometimes can get can get lost. Um, mm. So I think in getting out of my own way, it was probably all right. Well, just pull up a chair and let's let's go yeah but i guess that, so the the key thing there is that it, yeah so you're saying you can reconnect with that and actually that's been a quite positive thing for you but you've got to make sure if you are going to scale and you are going to grow that you can't be relied on or you can't be it can't be john we call we, oh, let's call john and he'll sort this for us like you've got to yeah. get way beyond that but yeah okay so what um a couple of things one really interested to hear like in your opinion, like what's been the most critical hire out of interest as you've grown this business? Like what's been the glue that's made this business you think? Has it been that sort of team that might be growing in the in the back office or I don't know, like out of interest for you? What's been one of the most critical hires that you think that's had one of the biggest impacts? I think the 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 biggest the, the biggest critical hires for me ha have been, I suppose, my immediate team. Okay. The, the, the ones that I can um the ones that we can sit down as a group of managing partners and go, right, how are we going to, how are we going to tackle that? And, and you know, I don't have all the answers, but to be able to, you know, I suppose if I look at the last three years, having Neil on the end of the phone and going, mate, I've had a shit day. Um, and just being able to be, I've had a shit mm. day. Um, to share that with it's people. Amazing, it's amazing how empowering that actually is. Um, and, you know, I think, solving these problems you know you'll see it one way someone else will see it a different way someone else will see it another way and ending up with this sort of um so it probably better solutions so i think certainly for me you know the, the 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 piece that fundamentally helped us grow was the trust levels i had in neil the trust that i've built with max those two now have enabled us to go right okay you can do that you can do that and we're all very confident in each other there's not a there's not a you know, sure. I need number one, you know, I'm pecking order here. It's, you know, collectively we're a team and we, we, we go from there. Um, I think latterly, um, last six months or so, it's probably been getting a really strong finance person involved. Um, yeah. We had someone who was involved with us for probably two years, two, two and a half years, almost like as a non-exec CFO. Um, and that was almost like an overlord of the finances. And that was really useful because, you know, that they they'd helped um, scale previous recruitment businesses. So they weren't a salesperson, but they were a finance person. They'd seen lots of different comp plans, lots of different this, lots of different that. And I suppose having that just totally external, probably non Robert Half background, because myself <laughs> and many others in our business have come through Robert Half um, has been very, very beneficial. And certainly sort of going through the last 12 months, 18 months, that's been massive, you know, having someone who I could rely on. Yeah, sure. 
That was, that was going to be my next question. Like, have, have you uh, had any experience in, I don't know, finding them? Like, because it seems like what's really obviously propelled the business, but also you personally is, yeah, having these, uh, obviously, yeah, other, you can call them like co-founders later down the line, whatever you want to call them, or other uh, yep. sort of directors in the business that you can really trust, that you back, and like you said, can share some of this this burden with, right? Yeah. I was going to ask you, yeah, have you had in your journey so far, had you engaged in a sort of maybe having a mentor or an NED? So it seems like you did do that, but it was more yeah, of so, a, it's so, actually so, someone from a CFO background. So finance yeah, so background. She, was, she was from a finance background. Um, it was less of a mentor. Um, I have worked with uh, like a business coach. Uh, okay. Uh, who actually I got introduced to at Robert Half. So it was oh, wow. Things, so he's someone I've worked with for 12 years, very very on and off but but just yeah probably someone in, in the early days that helped me define stuff um i've always been quite into i, I suppose business business books but like you know legacy like self-development by business yeah. yeah what sort of J legacy by james kerr if yeah that's great that. brilliant but we got james kerr to come and speak to us so we did oh really our annual annual big party and we had we had him come and speak and that was immense you know it, it was, oh, was I mean, amazing like, this this is where sometimes as, as, as an owner you sit there and you go right he normally does this to 300 400 people and he's sitting in a room of 30 of you and you're like yeah well you know you can indulge yourself once in a while but yeah, <laughs> big shout out to james kerr that was a brilliant day we've had um paul mcgee who wrote the sumo guy um so okay. that was that's a brilliant book it's a bit more personal self-help is sort of shut up and move on and it's about how do you overcome ob obstacles um we've had a couple of other people come and speak at the events and i think those sort of people just help you define stuff i've got to say james kerr in legacy there's lots of things that he speaks about in that book that have become very ingrained in us as a business like there is a lot of things from that particular book that i i would say if you are looking to well like the one build, or two things yeah there's the, what are they well, yeah. What would, what would you say? Like one of the two um, things that I've interested. One of the big things is is, I mean, there's the, there's the adage of like the no dickheads, but that that, that yeah. is, is one of the obvious ones. But I suppose one of the things is you will have people on your on the adventure. It, it, they're not going to be with you forever, and you need to celebrate the fact that someone was being with you for three years and they've done a brilliant job. And if they decide to leave, they've left your business hopefully in a better position. So thank them for it. And, don't be and bitter be about it. For that. Don't be bitter about it. And you know, it's it's that sort of time in the sun sort of thing. And you know, we're all doing this. So hopefully next year, the people that join us, it's it's easier and better for them to come into our business. Just because we had it hard, just because I started with nothing, doesn't mean I want someone else to start with nothing. And I suppose it's that that sort of uh, vision of every day we're trying to make it better for the new people joining our business. Those that haven't even joined us yet. Yeah, we want to try and make it as good as possible so when they do come in they can be the best version of themselves again if you see what i mean and then it's their yeah, yeah. their job is to make it better for the next group so you're know, always trying to strive to to make it better for the new people coming into the business yeah and i think that's that's definitely hasn't always been the mindset in recruitment has it and obviously no. as a business owner you want to protect your business if you have someone leaves that is going to do the exact same vertical and they've been a bit shady of course you're going to act but i think you i think that's just the better mindset to have isn't it you'd rather leave on good terms and you never know what might happen in a year two years time that person might go you know what john i've tried yep. to build this recruitment business it's fucking way harder than i thought it was <laughs> i really enjoyed my time at fjr i'd love yep. to be able to come back and like you're not even going to have that opportunity if you made it made them f just feel horrible and like it wasn't a nice departure do you know what i mean yeah. so i, I yeah. just yeah i love that um how um so i love the fact that you said that you've been working with a business coach i guess anything on that i've spoke to recently another recruitment business owner that's recently engaged with a business coach and said that it's been really transformative i don't anything else to share on that I haven't heard many business owners on here say that they've worked active with a business coach anything else that you feel like it's had a help i know you said it helps you define things and stuff like that but anything worth sharing that it's really impacted you on or helped you in building this business, do you think? It's worth sharing. I think, I think certainly in the early days, you, you had a million, a million different thoughts going through your mind about the different stuff, yeah. different challenges. <laughs> and I suppose where it was really useful working with Simon was you, you, you'd, you'd walk in cluttered and you'd yeah. walk out with 
a, a clarity. Really clear idea of what you're going to do, but not a plan. But most of it was around communication. Most of it was around. All right. So this is what you got to, you know, what you got to do. You know, most people in recruitment know what they've got to do. You know, you know what the challenge is, right? So, so how are you going to communicate with that team? Well, how are you going to do this? And, and he was super, super helpful in helping me frame conversations, frame, right. Okay. So, how do I how do I say this? And and he would make me role play. You know, I felt like a rookie again. You know, <laughs> role playing down the phone to him. And you know, and but you know what? When I look back and I, I remember sort of doing it for the first time, the engagement that we got, and then the I suppose the 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 camaraderie and and, and I suppose the togetherness we got from really practicing. Right, what what do I want people to hear? What do I want to say? But what do I want them to hear is the most important bit. Um, that was really useful working with the coach. So it was it was less around probably me and how do I make my business better, but right, okay, so how are you going to help me specifically communicate these messages? He's not going to do it. I've got to do it. But using that person as a really good sounding board and 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 human and how the human mind works and he you know, the dog brain and all this sort of stuff. Mm. You know, he he's worked with in the military and he's worked with a, a very high level within sport. And yeah, nice. it was all around that sort of sporting mentality, not sporting mentality, the, the, how, the, how, the, how you engage the brain, how you engage, not your brain, other people's brains to get people together. So, you know, certainly from that perspective, in that probably years two to, 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 to eight, that was really powerful when the business was growing and you just, it, was, it, it, was, it wasn't therapy in any way. It was, right, okay, these are my challenges, help me solve some of these. And let me walk out with a defined plan that I now need to go and execute. Yeah, nice. So a couple of things on the ask you before we finish. Definitely not ask you to sort of what the journey has been like in the last 12, 18 months of the business and where you're heading. But on this topic, like what's been always talk about mindset and everything on this on this podcast. Like what's been um your journey with your own mental health during this period? I guess don't have to talk Thanks. about the last 12, 18 months, but overall in building this business, how what's that been like for you? Um, it seems like you're quite invested in getting help or open-minded light. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm very fortunate. Uh, you know, I've got three young kids. I've got um, a, a wife that takes no shit. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and I've got, you know, a, a, a brilliant extended family in the local, local area. So, you know, from, from that perspective, I'm pretty lucky. Clearly in the last 10 years, there's been times when you're like, crap, this, yeah. if, if this all goes wrong, you're, you're screwed. You know, you've got, you know, you've got this, you've got that, you've got this, you've got that. And there have been times, you know, there have been times when I've sat on, sat in my car and I've gone, oh my God. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've had a moment, you know, um, but, you know, during those times I've been able to pick up the phone um, and I've, I've, I've been lucky that I've got that, that sort of group around me, if you see what I mean. But yeah, it is, it is super lonely. Um, it can be yeah. super lonely. Because sometimes you're the only one that really, really knows the skeletons in the cupboard. What's um, going on, yeah. But what I would say is going back to finding those people you can trust. When you find those people you can trust and you can talk about those skeletons, they sort of, you work out how to get rid of them. Whereas when mm. it's just you and that skeleton and, you know, you're facing off, it's a lot tougher. And that's why yeah. I really encourage people. And that's why, you know, I think certainly from my perspective, you know, bringing Neil into the business um, was awesome. Um, it really was. And, and you know, latterly having Max in the business for the last couple of years has been awesome. Um, you know, just the, the, that, that pool. And then I suppose right now, Nibes, who's, who's joined as the CFO, um, you know, you've got four people that we've all got different ideas and we can, we can share them. So, you know, and I think we're, we're good at trying to look after each other's mindsets. And you can tell when each other are down, but you know it's yeah. it's nice now. Yeah, we can jump on a call, and every Monday we have our kickoff call, and you know there's always a good bit of banter, and yeah, you know, you've got that 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 team piece. Um, yeah. As for the last eighteen months, um, I mean, I put something on on LinkedIn. You know, I'm 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 staggered um, how well most people have have sort of the the resilience of people. Um, mm. You know everyone's had their moments in the last 18 months you know I, I think anyone who said it's been a walk in the park is 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 probably being a little bit disingenuous but um how how different people have bounced back at different times how 
other people have sort of picked each other up how how good everyone was when it was like you know you go back to last march we were on a <laughs> ski slope on our, on the big adventure you know they, we, we had the top performers away we were in valteren we were at the top of the mountain we were king of the world oh wow it was it was phenomenal and we got back on the saturday night and it was like you need to be out of the hotel by midday tomorrow otherwise you're being impounded and it was like oh shit neva airport was crazy and all the rest of it but not necessarily that group because that that group were just amazingly hung over and weren't able to do anything <laughs> in, in, in the weeks after that how quickly people came together and how quickly you saw people accept things deal with things um you know you, you had the the first bit if you have asthma you have to work from home if you've got this and suddenly someone put their hand up and go i've got asthma and then you're like well could you leave the office please you know and it was you know some of these things you forget how draconian sudden, suddenly it became but yeah, you know, I'm mass massively proud of how the team, you know, developed. We I don't think we did anything massively different to a lot of other people. The Zoom calls, this and all the rest of it. But you know, mm. like many people, just just really proud about how how they they looked after each other. Um, mm. we, we 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 tried very hard. Um, but it's um, you know, certainly from from my perspective, you know, it still feels it still feels like you know, there's the more chapters in the covid pandemic to run it doesn't feel like it's quite going to be this nice serene exit from the pandemic that we're all hoping yeah. for. yeah i mean i can can i don't know what, what's been like the last quarter how's it been for the last quarter for you guys because i continue to hear how busy everyone is and people i'm sure you've seen it on linkedin record breaking months quarters yeah, all yeah. these things like how how's it how's it been now i guess yeah coming start of coming out the other side and what are you excited about yeah it's you know Clearly, there are businesses that are, that are hiring now, and you know, every, I think everyone sees it. You know, the, all the data is there's there's a lot going on in the market, and it's super exciting. Um, I think probably the market over the next twelve months is probably as good as a market as we're going to have for, a, for for a long, long time. You know, it's going to temper off. Um, mm. You know, as, as, as I suppose we get back to sort of a bit more business as usual. Um, I think the really exciting thing is we we've, we've over the past eighteen months. We've we've solidified what we've got in London. Um, you know, we've managed to, to to keep that going during the during the pandemic. You know, we're then on the front foot. We've got Chicago now going. We've got clients in Chicago. We've got Edinburgh. And suddenly, you're like, when you start to break down our 25 by 25 by 25, it's like we're on track. You know, mm -hmm. this is you know, we, we can do. We are going to do this, guys. You know, and and I think the fact that we've broken the the first, you know, I don't say international places because we've done lots of international placements from the UK, but like we've 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 done that. We're on the, the you know that 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 cherry has been popped. You know, we are we are active. We've got our own business in the in the US, and yeah. suddenly you're like, you know, oh man, this is so exciting. I mean, when when James called me on Wednesday evening to tell me he'd done his deal, I was like hopping around the streets like a man. Right, you know, it was it was yeah. just. It was just brilliant. And, and, you know, I think it's those little milestones that you sort of, you know, I'll remember that forever now. You know, that's, 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 that's one of the baked in moments of FJR mm -hmm. history. If you know what I mean, and, you know, there's not many of them. And as I get older, I probably forget some of the earlier ones, but you know, it's, it's really, really important to, to, to celebrate those, those milestones. Cause you know, there are the things that, you know, everything starts with the first step, the first deal, the first, this, but suddenly you can get that momentum. And, and I think, you know, certainly at the moment, it feels like we're on the front foot with uh, a ton of really good stuff about to happen. Yeah, I love that. So now I've got a final question for you is um, if you could change the industry, what, what would you improve? If I could change the industry, what would I improve? Um, I would love everyone to have a little bit more respect for, for what we do. I think we've done a really good job over the last 20 years in some of our price pricing for a race to the bottom. And, mm. and I think therefore we get treated as an industry, um, how we price ourselves, if that makes sense. So yeah. I think sometimes we, we, we've ended up giving ourselves a bad reputation by not valuing the service. And I think certainly mm. one of the things that I've noticed very quickly in North America, is how much more respect they have for staffing people. Um, yeah. And I would love, I'd love to be able to correct that because people give their heart and souls for their clients and candidates. 
But I think we've we've whether it's through pricing, whether it's through behaviors, but certainly I think I'd love to have that level of respect where, you know, you don't sit at a dinner party and go, what do you do? I'm a recruitment. Yeah, um, yeah, agreed. Uh, whereas, you know, it's, it's it, it, you know, speaking to clients in the US, they're, they're like, yeah, yeah, you, you provide a service and they're prepared to pay for it. But they also want their pound of flesh for it, if you see what I mean. So it goes mm. both ways. But I, I, I love the fact that there's a better level of respect. Um, and I think that's one thing I'd love to have changed. Love that. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for being so open and honest. It's uh, no, excited to, we definitely have to get you uh, back on when, yeah, on the other side of this 25, 25, 25. Or Absolutely. I'd another, love to. yeah, it'd be amazing. Well, um, John, been an absolute pleasure and thanks for coming on. Perfect.